And hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last webinar in our 2020 Leading with Evidence series. Today, we will be discussing the importance of focusing on building evidence as part of program development for young people of color. I'm Suzanne Barnard, the Director of Evidence-Based Practice at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I will be one of your moderators today. The uh, Annie E. Casey Foundation is in our fifth year of delivering the Leading with Evidence series of convenings and webinars. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the many contributions of the William T. Grant Foundation to this series. Um, our aim is to offer practitioners and researchers ways to um, immediately apply programs and practices to better deliver and strengthen the utility of our work. Um, our webinar today is focused on increasing the number of effective programs that reliably demonstrate improved outcomes for youth and young adults with an emphasis on um, use of evidence combined with culturally responsive practices. Uh, we will cover information about our evidence building strategies and how they impact communities of color. We will also hear from two program leaders and developers who will introduce you to their asset-based programs. We will complete this agenda with a facilitated panel featuring our two presenters, and there will be time for questions and discussion during that panel and at the end of the entire presentation. But before we get started, as always, I want to take a moment to go over some important housekeeping details for this webinar. We will, uh, as we have in the past, keep our attendees on mute throughout the webinar. We ask that you submit your questions by entering them in the Q&A window, which you see circled on the so slide. You'll find that window um, at the lower right-hand corner of the screen, and you can submit a question there to the panelists. If you are in full screen mode and want to ask a question, you may need to return to the event window uh, by using the drop down controls at the top of your screen. And I will also mention that this presentation is being recorded, as you heard at the beginning, and the recording and slides will be available later at AECF.org. So I'm excited to welcome our speakers for this presentation. They are Io Atterbury, Senior Associate with the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Evidence-Based Practice Team, my team. Uh, Johanna Moy Fabregas, Director of Texas-Based Comi Madre. And Kadir Abdul Rahim from Atlanta, Georgia, who is the newly appointed Chief Equity Officer for the City of Atlanta and the former CEO of the Future Foundation. And with that, I'd like to turn this presentation over to Io, who will tell us more about Casey's portfolio of investments and program development, by and for communities of color, and she will lead the panel, which features, again, our two presenters. Hey, Io. Welcome. Hey, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, and as Suzanne said, I'm Io Atterbury with the Annie Casey Foundation. So I will provide some background on why we're talking about developers of color today. So the mission of the foundation is to ensure that every child has a bright future. One strategy to help us reach that goal is focused on increasing the number of effective programs that demonstrate improved outcomes with an emphasis on people of color. And we want to make sure we identify what works for populations that need it most. Our strategy is steeped in research, and research tells us that lived experience and relationships are key factors for behavior change. We also know that participants are more likely to have positive outcomes if they share background, culture, and beliefs with those who develop and deliver services. We know that there is underrepresentation of developers of color on evidence-based programs, and existing clearinghouses and directories of evidence-based programs have very few programs that are proven to work for children, youth, and families of color. So we took what we were learning and from research and began to look to think differently about the programs we're investing in, making developers of color a priority as they build evidence for effective interventions. Next slide, please. And, um, and this is because we know that culture and context matter. We started looking at the cultural matches of programs to specific populations to see if they fit with the beliefs and lived experiences of developers. We want to increase the number of evidence-based programs norm for people of color because on reviews we've conducted, less than 8% of programs officially designated as evidence-based can show results specifically for communities of color. And we want to close this gap. 
We want to support high-risk communities, and this includes com communities of color, because those communities face the greatest systemic challenges that include systemic racism. And finally, we want to increase our philanthropic investment in developers and leaders of color, because we know that over the past 15 years, on um, annual foundation grant making focused on supporting leaders of color range between 9 to 12 percent of domestic giving, which is substantially low. And that's a bit about how the foundation came to support this strategy. And today, you will hear from two leaders of color, Johanna with Comey Madre and Kadir with Future Foundation. So now I will turn it over to, to Johanna. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. Okay, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thank you, Ayo, and hi, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. Like she said, I'm Joanna Moya Fabregas from Come Madre, and we are an organization based of Austin, Texas, um, and our name, Come Madre, in Spanish means with my mother, and Madre is an acronym that means mothers and daughters raising expectations. And so, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, I'll tell you a little bit about who we are. And we hope to accomplish. So our mission is to empower young Latinas and their mothers through education and support services that increase preparedness, participation, and success in post-secondary education. Those last three are the names of our main programs as well, which I'll describe in a moment. And our vision is to see that all Latina students are equipped with knowledge and support to rewrite the narrative of their family and their community. We know that our programs have a generational impact, and, and that's why we strive to serve all. Next slide, please. So how did we get started? How did the organization begin? Uh, we were originally founded and in, incubated in 1992 by uh, Junior League of Austin uh, Project. So we were the Hispanic Mother-Daughter Program. And, um, and at the moment, it, and I always tell this story because it is very significant. In the early 90s, and thank, thankfully things have changed a bit, a Latina baby had less than a 1% chance of securing a college education. So I always like to ask people to just let that sink in, less than 1% chance. So what does that mean for, for you know, the, the financial opportunities of that family? What does that mean for breaking cycles of poverty? I mean, the, the hopes were pretty grim. And um, since then, those rates have increased, but we still have, uh, you know, we still have an issue with uh, Latina students not not having the opportunities to achieve, you know, their the capacity, not having the opportunities to break those cycles. And um, and by 2016, one of our one third of the female population of the United States will be Latina. So our program was relevant back then uh, because of the impact that it would have in our population. It's relevant now because of that same reason, but also because if you consider that one-third of the population will be Latina, that means who's going to be driving our economy, who are going to be our professionals. So by, by investing and, and focusing on those that we serve, we are also having a direct impact on the U.S. economy. Uh, next slide, please. So our program is based on four pillars, um, parental engagement. Um, we, as one of the things that makes us unique is that we work both with the parents and the student, with the mother and the students. If there's not a mother present, we will work with an aunt, a grandma, an uncle, anyone who will, you know, who will step up and be part of the process. And um, if we really want to make an impact and change, the opportunities that a family has, we have to look at the family holistically. So we offer moms and daughters the social emotional skills they need to advocate for themselves and to navigate not only the education process, but all the situations that they might be uh, presented with. And then empowerment, uh, we equip moms and daughters with the knowledge and skills to succeed in spite of systemic barriers. Agency is a big part of our program. We don't tell them what they should do. We equip them with the tools and help them unearth what they already bring to the table so that they can make their choices and set their path. And we're community center. We work because no, no worthwhile job is done alone. Uh, we work with local organizations, 
and individuals to better meet the needs of the community. So we're in constant conversation with others um, in, in our community. Next slide, please. So I'll share a little bit about our programming. Um, our programming is based on a social emotional curriculum that is implemented in the schools during the school day, um, during an elective hour or um, or a you know a, a lunch period. And as you can see here on the left side of the slide is a list of the, our core programs: uh, preparation, participation, and and success. And you can see the grades there. One is primarily middle school and some high school. Then um, at that age, we start working with students and thinking about what um, what is like being a teenager. What are some of the pressures they have? Uh, how to navigate those issues? And we talk to the parents at the same time, even though the groups are with the students. We have parent groups as well. And to help them navigate that process, all of us here were teenagers at some point, and we know that it's a complex period. And if you're going to start setting college goals, you know, higher education goals, that is the age sixth grade where normally it begins to happen. So that's why we start with that age group, and we start introducing also college terminology into our curriculum, and then introducing this ability to dream. Because when you come from an from a background where um, where you know financial means are limited, uh, you don't you sometimes you don't have the luxury to dream, and and we start we begin with that part, and then um, our next program focuses on students who are about to go into college, and we walk them through the process hand by hand. And this uh, we have uh, the moms participate in after school programming. Uh, called College Academies, where we walk them through applying for financial aid, deciding what school to go to, um, weighing their options, building, you know, a financial a financial health in their life, or all of that. And then we have our post-secondary uh, program, the Success, where we work with college students virtually, and we're currently serving students in 15 different colleges you know, across the country. Our after-school programs. Um, Sorry, our after school programs uh, are the ones you see on the right, college visits, fairs, volunteer, and all of those include the moms as well. And um, and all the participants for our, our programs have the chance to come together and meet people from other parts of you know the, the city or the community. Uh, next slide, please. So our impact. Um, in, for this past year, we served 91% students of color. 68% were at least were free and reduced lunch, and over 54% were first generation college students. Um, these are students, you know, who, if it weren't for a program that can walk them through this process of, of how do you think about and, and set goals to go to college, uh, oftentimes they wouldn't they wouldn't even imagine that because they see it as a very far goal. And um, and our milestones, you know, for this year we served 900 plus mother daughter teams, so double that number, and 98 percent of uh, high school uh, high schooler students graduated. We had a 76 percent enrollment rate, and um, and this this one I'm very proud of. 66 percent graduated with honors or made dean's list for our college students. And we track their grades, even though that's not the focus of the program. We track their grades, and 79% uh, of all of our participants had a 3.0 GPA or higher. Next slide, please. Um, so here's where I'd like to talk a little bit about our data and our evaluation process. And I'm going to walk you through the path of where we started and where we are now. So if you look at the left, top left slide, uh, visual on the slide, we started uh, with a pre and post survey design where we would give our participants the same survey at the beginning and at the end of the year to compare results. Uh, and it was based on our curriculum that delivered at students' campuses. We realized over time, and, and Annie Casey Foundation played a significant role in helping us think through this process of our evidence and how we conceptualize it. Um, and we identified some issues with the design that it didn't evaluate other areas of programming, like out-of-school programs, because this was focused on the in-school uh, groups that we hold. 
it um, didn't take into account students who were there at the beginning of the year and maybe uh, maybe left uh, because the family moved. And the questions were centered around stakeholder expectations. So in other words, around different funders, different community, um, you know, stakeholders who, who would want to know questions like, well, what's the pregnancy rate? And we would have that in there, but our program is not focused on measuring pregnancy rates or, or, you know, or sexual education. But so we, by, by including that, those questions in there, what we're communicating to the student is a very different narrative. So we changed that and then it didn't capture the areas of concern in an ongoing basis. So this, this uh, focus that we had was very much deficit thinking stakeholder center. After evaluating and many, many conversations, we went into a participant expectation service where we asked the participants what support they like to receive from our organization and what their goals are. So we start with that agency right from the beginning. And when we have our entry exit surveys, uh, they can provide feedback on service and, and they're assessed on learning. And the, resu the results are continuously used to evaluate our programs and to make modifications. We also collect uh, testimonials uh, from uh, participants and, and things that they're proud of so that we have that qualitative aspect that is very important because from there you can, when you look at all of that data that you've collected and the things that keep coming up in the trends, you can see what matters to our population. And then we do an end of the year satisfaction survey where they can rate, um, where the participants rate uh, the satisfaction with our programming and provide feedback on areas that need to be improved. So we moved from a stakeholder to a participant centered evaluation modality and that's aspirational thinking that's proactive. And that is from the get go, just by the questions that we ask communicating to our participants that empowerment and that agency that we hope to build throughout their, their tenure in the program. And thank you so much. I'm happy to answer more questions later. I will turn it over to Kadira from the Future Foundation. Thank you, Johanna. Good afternoon. I'm excited to discuss a very important topic that is near and dear to me, the Future Foundation. We were founded in 2001 by my brother, Sharif Abdurrahim. We grew up in Atlanta together with very humble beginnings. In 1995, we graduated from high school together and had the opportunity to attend Cal Berkeley on athletic scholarships. When we arrived, we had a pretty tough time competing academically. I remember at one point a tutor saying to me, you don't know basic algebra. How did you even get here? That was the first of many really hard conversations for Sharif and me related to competing academically. Yet we persisted. Midway through our freshman year, Sharif came to me and said, Kadira, if I ever have the opportunity, I am going to go back to Atlanta and create a place where students like us have a support system to navigate graduating high school and entering into some type of post-secondary institution. And Sharif, he kept his word. Fast forward to 2003, Sharif called me while I was living in California and asked me to come back home and help launch the Future Foundation. Based on our lived experience, we developed the Future Foundation to accomplish a mission to level the playing field for youth caught in the cycle of poverty by serving as a second family. You can go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. Kadira, are you not seeing the next slide? Yes, I see the next slide. Okay, great, you can go ahead. So you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So Atlanta has been defined as one of the hardest places for children to climb out of poverty. 
And we know that the systems that continue to generation to perpetuate generational poverty weren't erected overnight, and they won't come down tomorrow, even though they should for, for the sake of all of us. So the work that we're doing at Future Foundation is about all of us uniting to bring together resources to break the cycle of generational poverty now. And coming together in love, open to innovation and transparency is how we can create a second family to spark the change and end these seemingly perpetuous cycles of poverty. The question that we continuously ask ourselves at Future Foundation is how are we breaking the cycle and what data are we gathering to demonstrate why it matters? This slide represents our program's logic model and it highlights the following. We have a theory of change, and our theory of change says that children can overcome generational poverty when they have access to health, academic, income, and family support. At Future Foundation, we are ensuring our students access to health, academic, income, and familial support through a two-generation program that implements evidence-based curricula in four domains in the four domains that I mentioned for our own community's collective impact. On a daily basis, including summer months, we use our nine school program sites as hubs to leverage resources from local businesses, the state, the federal government, and local, national, and, uh, local and national nonprofit organizations. We leverage these resources to support the middle and high school students we serve. We operate 180 days per year. Again, students receive health, academic, career support, while the entire family receives engagement opportunities. Our students graduate from middle to high school and graduate at a 100% graduation rate. When they graduate from high school, they are equipped with a network a wide-reaching second family developed during their time with us at Future Foundation. Now you've heard about the key elements of our logic model. You might be inclined to start thinking about specific program inputs, outputs, stakeholders, and all those other parts of the logic model. But I did want to share with you a quick story of how it all comes together and how in the end that second family uh, is really important. Kawana Tully is one of our students who started with Future Foundation in the fourth grade back in 2003. She graduated from high school. She's the first person in her family to graduate from college and earn her master's degree. After speaking at one of our events, she obtained the job with our local United Way. One day she was casually telling a mentor that she met during our program that she had purchased her first car. The mentor, who is also a first-generation college graduate, knew to ask Kawana more questions and discovered Kawana had signed a deal on a predatory loan. Kawana and the mentor are now working together to refinance that loan, support the development of a financial plan, and support Kawana in purchasing her first home, which she, her mom, and her brother plan on moving into soon. No one in Kiwana's family has ever owned a home. So I just wanted to share that quick story about how all of our work comes together. So going back to the lovely quantifiable parts of our logic model, a significant part of our measurement journey has been about going deep and serving individual participants so that we evolve into an organization that can help transform students in high schools by increasing high school graduation rates. To go deep, you can see that we started 2001, 2010 with a lot of programming and individual program evaluations. In 2011, we shifted. We eliminated some programming, created the theory of change I described earlier. We then developed an organizational-wide evaluation plan. This shift allowed the Future Foundation to organize nine years of longitudinal data to inform program strategy. This shift enabled us to improve our program practices to strengthen outcomes, and the evidence of our work can be seen through the implementation of an RCT. 
Our focus on research and data analytics is becoming a signature feature of the Future Foundation. We are truly learning how to blend data and relationships to create more robust outcomes for our children, their families, and communities. Next slide. Our, our, our results reflect our theory of change activities. During the last school year, 68% of our students improved academically. We engaged 57% of our parents. 78% of our students increased their social and emotional development. We served 500 youth and their families while maintaining a 100% graduation rate since 2009. 98% of our students are African American and 90% of them participate in the free and reduced lunch program. That concludes Future Foundation's presentation. Turn it over to Io. And thank you, Joanna and Kadir, for sharing background information about your organization. So now for our participants, here's an opportunity for you to submit questions in the Q&A feature on your um, screen. And you'll see an infographic here that with the red circle showing where you enter your questions. So we'll move into panel's questions and we'll take your questions as they come up. So the first question for both Joanna and Kadira, what is evidence and what does it mean for your organization? Johanna, since you're on mute, I will go first. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Well, now you're off of me, so please do go first. I'm so sorry. I, I keep making the same mistake, sorry. Um, so for us, evidence means the ability to measure and communicate the impact of our work in a way that speaks to the needs of our participants. So like I was saying earlier, evidence, there's a lot of definitions. Evidence could uh, mean different things depending on who is looking at it but for a program focused on serving youth of color and their impact, it has to be, uh, you know, measured, like our impact has to be measured in a way that makes sense to those that we serve. So that's, that's the highlight for us. Thank you. Evidence for, for Future Foundation is, is our ability to collect manage, analyze, narrate, and disseminate data. It's our ability to use data to share compelling stories of success. It's our ability to convey that when an organization or collective of people are intentional about leveraging existing resources residing within local businesses, state and federal agencies, and other nonprofits, children can succeed. It's our ability to also use data and successful outcomes to show that generational poverty is not a natural phenomenon. The proof is our ability to show that if structures can be created to maintain, generation, to maintain generational poverty, then structures can be created to alleviate generational poverty. When we accomplish the goal of serving as a second family to children, and are intentional about dismantling, dismantling generational poverty, we do the two things. We create success for children and we evolve as a learning organization. Ultimately, we implement the strategies that allow Future Foundation to work together across the community to create system level change. And that's what evidence means to our organization. Um, thank you to you both. Next slide, please, Kate. So talk about your primary lessons learned in your evidence or scaling journey. We'll start with you, Joanna. Yes, um, on our evidence and scaling journey, we learned that, first we learned the, the importance of what questions we were asking and to, and who was driving, whose agenda was driving those questions. And along the way, we learned that when we ask questions that are, uh, participants, you know, our participants, those who we, who we serve, participant focused uh, and, and focused on their experience and their outlook of the world. When we 
and, and this is a very subjective process of that, but when we go that route, we are able to deliver a more culturally appropriate programming. Um, our, our results, you know, speak for themselves, and we can see the, the impact of our work. We also learn in this process to involve um, our whole team in the evidence uh, journey, in in thinking about, you know, that there, for instance, our, our social workers who are on the ground and they're working directly with the students and the families, they get to see firsthand what are some of those trends. Uh, they get to uh, see what are the changes throughout the groups that they serve. So it makes sense that when we're in the process of creating questions to evaluate our program, um, that those questions don't um, don't come top down, uh, that they come out of an, a collaboration and, a, and an ongoing conversation with all of our staff within our programming because they all bring a different perspective. Um, that is very important uh, to capture the impact of our work. And um, and then also we've learned in this in this process that the 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 results that you uh, get with the evidence, uh, the impact, they, they it, it's a it's a cycle. They spark questions about the process. They spark questions about um, how how we are seeing our students. So this is uh, I guess I'm, I'm going into a, a philosophical tangent here, but it's it's very important. We started this whole journey with you know, we need to do an evaluation of, of the impact of our work. We need to do a formative evaluation. We need to get ready for that. And the more we started unpacking our work and what we're doing and the questions we're asking and how our organization has evolved, the more we realize uh, how important it is to continue working towards putting the, the participant at the center of the program, putting their cultural perspective at the center of the program, and being able to develop tools, which we're in the process of doing, to capture that um, that uh, cultural outlook that our program has, that is not just based on having uh, bilingual programming or you know or uh, focusing on Latina students. So there's a lot more that goes into it, and, and I'm I'm happy to talk about it a little bit later, so I don't take up the whole time. Uh, but that that has come out out of this evidence journey as well. Thank you. I'll let I could hear Thank you, Johanna. In reflection, we we have learned so much through this evidence-based journey. We've learned that gathering local community uh, knowledge matters. We've learned that experiencing the prior sensation of that thing you are trying to change matters tremendously. So really thinking about um, people who have lived an experience and, and those people carrying out and executing this work that we're talking about. We've learned that our work is both uh, personal at times and professional. Our RCT research has taught us the most. We are extremely grateful for the support of Annie E. Casey along the way as thought partners on this journey. We wanted to end our RCT study during our first year due to the rigor of the study, but the Annie E. Casey team reminded us that sometimes with an RCT, the most significant learning comes from process developed, processes developed. And they reminded us that there is a considerable amount of learning through failure. And that advice support was invaluable because eventually we were able to communicate the critical processes and best practices learned to other funders. Which leads me to my next primary lesson learned is that when we began to demonstrate more substantial evidence, we saw our funding substantially increase. Another lesson learned is that before going into the RCT, our sites had an average rate of students recruited and retained. The RCT site doubled the average rate. And so we were able to document best practices that will allow our entire team to double the amount of youth historically recruited and retained in our programs. 
the last and very, uh, I won't say most important, but very important lesson we learned was the power of networks. Having access to the Casey Network for organizations that were similar to Future Foundation, it's been invaluable. We've been able to um, talk through similar issues and build solutions together with members from that network. And when COVID hit our community, it was having a network in place that allowed our organization to pivot so quickly and adjust our services. So we really, through our research and evidence journey, have learned the importance of formally organizing networks. Thank you. And thank you, Lise. I want to say I underscore both points, all the points that you all made. Um, moving on to the next question is, how are you changing culture based on evidence? Um, how do you operationalize culture in your program? Yes. Um, so in terms of how, how we change culture based on evidence, I think having this opportunity, having had this opportunity to, again, offered by the Annie Casey Foundation, and I, it's, I can't stress that enough because it really has made an impact in our program uh, and in how we articulate our evidence and how we collect our evidence and how we focus it on our participants has um, has given us leverage to change the conversation uh, with with um, stakeholders, uh, with um, an array of funders, and it's and there is this there's been this culture at, at least in in our region and our pretty sure it's not much different throughout the country where um, oftentimes the funder determines what what type of evidence they want to see from you. They determine, you know, how this we, we give you this much, this much, you know, funds for your program, and then you have to collect and respond to these questions um, in order for that to continue to happen. And we've been able to take uh, this evidence process and to take those conversations to major funders here in, in, in Austin, Texas, and to I've been able to take those conversations to other organizations and approach major funders in in taking uh, more of a thought you know a thought partnership, um, a thought leader partnership in addressing the issues of our community. Um, in in showing how uh, culturally appropriate programming has been here all along, this year has been particularly you know intense. Not just because COVID, but because of COVID and and, and the and the climate uh, and the political climate this year. There's been a lot of the the disparities um, have you know risen to the surface. A lot of the inequities when it comes to uh, race and and economics have risen to the surface. And and suddenly there have been a number of uh, stakeholders asking, well, you know, let's start having a conversation about how we address those issues that you know that communities of colors first that face, and um, and having having a hold and a grip on our evidence um, and and engaging our community in those conversations has positions as well to say, no, wait a minute, you know, this is not these are not conversations that should be starting now. We have been doing the work all along. We have been addressing these issues at the root all along, and this is how we're doing it. So what we have learned as a program uh, in this process, we've been able to take to other organizations, and right now, for instance, we're in the process of creating a cultural IQ, if you will, we're still perfecting the name pathway, where we can look at similar organizations in the area and identify how is it that each one of us gets the results we do, rather than, you know, we do it, like I said earlier, because we have people who look like those that we serve or because we, um, you know, offer services to particular groups or because we do it in Spanish too, that is not enough. And, and along the way, we've been able to realize that is having, is having, uh, focusing our evidence, you know, on collecting the evidence of how we build identity, how students can show up and be themselves, and being themselves is their superpower, how we, how we, you know, strengthen that and bring that out how we empower, how we develop 
agency. So you might have the identity, but if you don't have the tools, you cannot move forward. Um, and in order to move forward, you know, you need uh, opportunities and you need community. So we've been able to map that out and are in the process of creating a tool collectively with other organizations where we can measure that that very slippery concept culture that it's thrown around a lot, but that has a very significant impact in programs like ours and, and like Kadira's program that she was just sharing. Uh, and that oftentimes there's a lot of assumptions under the concept of culture and and it could mean many things. So we're in the process of doing that. That's why I'm, I'm speaking in general. And, um, and then overall is highlighting the cultural the, the cultural IQ of the work that we do and that all of our staff does and and that all those other organizations in the community do and like being able to come together having been part of um, the Annie Casey evidence group during COVID like Kadira was saying was a blessing because it was a very tricky time for all all of our organizations and figuring out how to change how to you know think on our feet and and switch our programs in a way that was relevant to those that we serve. So for me, at least the experience of being able to be part of that group empowered me, empowered me to reach out within my community to other organizations, and we've been able to together secure funding from new funders for all of us and to launch our, you know, our, our evidence collecting culture into a, into a path where it's um, where it's collective, and what we can we can talk about the collective impact and leverage of the work that we do in the community. Thank you. So, so focusing on data and research has truly been a tough journey for Future Foundation, as with uh, many nonprofits. A lot of the teams are driven by the heart and the data and research aspect of the work is just not as motivating, but it's necessary. By, by working with the Annie EKC team, we've been able to strengthen the real-time performance feedback loop. We've been able to put process in place that allows our team to build knowledge and learn from that knowledge every week versus at the end of a semester or a school year to make programmatic impact. The opportunity for our team to regularly review, learn, and adjust the work that they have been implementing, it engages them, increases their own understanding of how they are contributing to community impact, building their own personal skill sets, and really, quite honestly, becoming better narrators about the work that they do every day. And this dynamic is improving culture, and it's, and it's truly building self-efficacy um, in our organization. And I know I shouldn't say this, but I will say it because I think it's important to say I, I just really want to express how grateful I am to the Annie E. Casey Foundation for their forethought to support leaders, leaders of color even before the double pandemic disrupted our country. As a leader of color, a first-generation college graduate that started up a community-based organization with a limited network, the journey uh, was unbelievably tough. I often thought of Future Foundation as the little engine that could. And when, and when things got really tough, I would always say, I think, I think we can, I think we can, I think we can. And when, when Annie E. Casey got involved with our organization, their involvement really empowered us to know that we can through, through building our evidence journey. So for that, I will, I will always be grateful. So thank you. And thank you, um, Kadira and Joanna, for sharing um, your culture pieces, both the culture of 
bringing race, ethnicity, and beliefs to the table in the culture of having performance management evaluation and data. And we do have some um, additional questions for you. And this one's for you, Johanna, and it's about the participant survey, survey modality shift. When you start by asking students what they want or need, does that mean the evaluation is customized to each student's initial input, or do you generalize the pre-post survey based on the student input? Yeah, the the questions the questions are they are uniform, um, so that we are able to measure you know to measure like across of all of those that we serve. But they provide, because we included qualitative questions in there as well, they provide the opportunity for the student to also highlight uh, those areas that might be the most important to them. And then, and then what we can do as we move forward, we can, uh, for instance, for each one of our programs uh, this year we, that we've gone online, one of the things we started doing, and we will continue after we, you know, after the post-pandemic world, whatever that looks like, um, we, are, we are asking questions also after each activity, each group uh, that students participate. So the answers to those questions help us think, okay, for the, for the questions at the beginning of the next year, what are things that we may modify, that we may add to, um, to capture that experience, you know, better. Hope that answers the question. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And for you, Kadira, um, in this question, you may have touched on, but maybe you can give a little more information um, or reiterate is how many students do you serve each year and also how many families? So we serve 500 students annually, and then we serve their parents. So very much like Johanna, you know, you can you can double that number um, because at a minimum, our students have either um, a mom in the home, primarily a mother in the home, um, very very small percentage with two family households. Um, but we don't see two parent households showing up to our parent engagement workshop, so it's typically one parent. So and you can take 500 and double it. So we're servicing 1,000 participants annually. Thank you both. And a question for both of you all, and you can, um, we'll just start with Joanna, is um, do you follow your program participants through their collegiate experience? Yes, yes, we, we start with our students in the sixth grade. That's when we recruit and we stay with them throughout uh, their, you know, their middle school, high school, and college. And when they come to college, they can, they choose whether they want to continue the program or not. I mean, that's, it's a separate program, but we stay with them throughout their career. And, and we have many that long after, you know, they've graduated and, and they've gone on to, to do their own thing, they come back and they want to volunteer, they want to help with the organization, or they bring other family members. So we, we had a, a former uh, chief program officer she went through the program herself and it, from middle school through college, um, and she had, I think, 11 of her family members that ended up going through our program over the years. So it's, it's very much um, a family environment that we create. And when I was talking about that cultural piece, one of the things that we, that we reproduce in, in a programmatic setting is the family environment that the cultural family environment that students you know expect to have at home? So uh, we naturally end up becoming the the go-to persons when other things pop up in their lives. So now through COVID, we were able to help a lot of students and connect them with resources beyond what we do because of that relationship. Oh. Ayo, can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Sure. The question is, um, do you follow your students uh, through their collegiate experience, your participants? So we, we do not follow our students through 
their collegiate experience. We, we just do not have the capacity and we've told funders that over the years. Um, but I think we've been extremely intentional about those networks and the second family approach. And quite honestly, what is happening is that organically, our students are learning how to build relationships through the network that they are, um, that we're creating from sixth through the 12th grade. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the natural mentorship and second family is extending beyond high school graduation. And many of our students are uh, developing relationships with mentors and companies where they can go get their first job, et cetera. So, the second family network is really quite honestly um, happening organically past uh, past high school for our students. And the the other thing that I will say about Future Foundation and our capabilities to track beyond high school, one of the things that the evidence journey has also taught us is um, how to effectively share data. And so right now, as we are dreaming up and going through our next strategic planning process, one of the ways that we are thinking about extending our work is identifying key partnerships that will allow us to extend our work beyond high school, not necessarily where we are doing direct services, but we are partnering with organizations, key organizations who provide services after high school graduation. Um, and and striking up and figuring out how to develop shared measurement agreement so that we can track collaboratively with, with these other service providers um, where our kids are from an income perspective at 23 years of age. Thank you, um, Kadir and Johanna. And we have another question for you, and this is, um, an opportunity to go a little deeper when you talk about your evidence journey, and this is about um, what are some examples of program and also even organizational changes that you've made in response to what you've learned through your evaluation journey? Yes, for for us, for Comimadres, we, um, when our program started and, and the, the evidence that we measured you know, for a long time was um, was the programming that we implemented in the schools. Uh, curriculums, normally we have uh, partnership agreements with uh, the districts and then they determine what schools we go into and um, and that's where, where we lead our groups, um, which are small groups of about 15 students, so we might have more than one depending on the, per school, depending on the size. Uh, we used to measure that uh, that work in in the in the questions that we would ask the students. We um, we learned about their need for um, to be connected with mentors, for instance. And so we created a Comi Hermana with my sister, a mentorship program um, with uh, leaders in our community that that guide our students um, who are you know in high school uh, through, uh, through their education and help them, you know, with the college process. Then uh, along the way, we learned um, the importance of, even though the program started with focusing on, on graduating students from high school, and then we learned, no, if in today's economy, if you really have, if you really want to have an impact in changing the narrative of someone's family, uh, they need to be able to get into and through college. And so we started focusing on and measuring retention rates, um, which we didn't for a long time. So it's it's been kind of a symbiotic process where we, uh, from the evidence that we that we um, are able to collect, we're able to go back and analyze. Okay, what other services can we be providing? How can we set it up so we can get there? And then at the same time, it informs. Um, it informs how those services are developed and then how we are going to subsequently collect evidence for uh, for that work. So it's 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 a cycle um, that it's it's ongoing. 
as we grow and, and, and develop as, a, as an organization. Same thing with including parenting. And just to add one more thing, parenting program. Uh, we have parent support groups. We, um, we just recently um, surveyed our families and learned that they, you know, they, they, because of the issues with the digital divide are not just not having access to computers or hotspots or access to the internet, but it's also computer literacy. So we're now looking into a partnership with other organizations so that we can provide uh, what parents need, which is uh, access to learning how to use a computer and how to manage uh, everything virtual. So all of this comes from um, from our evidence uh, gathering process and then how we analyze it and what we do with it. Thanks. That's a good question. It's a, it's a very great question. Yes. Very great question. And for us, so Future Foundation is embarking on our 20th year of service in 2021. And for our first 11 years, we were very much focused on um, the individual student and how we went really deep with them and provided wraparound services for that individual student. And I remember our board tasking me with probably around 20, 2012. Um, we have been measuring the impact on, on our individual students' high school graduation rate, that 100% graduation rate that I, I kept mentioning earlier. We're very proud of that. Um, and it was something we talked about a lot. But our board asked me the question, maybe around 2012, you know, they said, Kadira, we're really happy with this 100% graduation rate, but we're looking around and all the schools in our community have half this graduation rate or 70% of it, you know, how do we start impacting entire high school graduation rates? Um, and so, you know, we started really thinking, looking at our data and thinking about like how we could start working with others to lead collaborative efforts. And so we, we very much looked at our data, very much looked at our evidence and, and have, we've shifted to a model that's very focused on collaboration and how we work with others to improve system system changes. So I would say that has been the biggest shift. And to Johanna's point, um, it's it's very iterative. Um, and I think one of the things that we both reiterated today is the the learning component of of our journeys. Um, through each phase iteration of what we're going through, there have been huge learning components for our organizations. And that learning drives us closer to being able to implement stronger programs that have uh, system level change. Thank you. Oh, and um, so Thank you, uh, Johanna Kadira, and all of our participants, um, and for your questions. And I we just looked at the time. That was our final question um, this afternoon. We unfortunately didn't get to everyone's questions. We don't have time for all of them, but we thank you for your participation and your questions. And now I'll move it to Suzanne to close us out. Thanks. Thank you, Io and Joanna and Kadira, for sharing your experiences and your expertise. This was just so interesting. You've given us lots of ideas and you've helped us think about, um, you know, high quality development and implementation. So appreciate you sharing your evidence journey um, and your, your, just your experiences. Um, uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, yes, this does bring us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, on your screen, you'll see links to our previous webinars and including how to get a recording of this webinar and strongly encourage you to do that. It's so, so full of great information. Uh, to our audience, uh, listening audience, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. There were a lot of them, and they were really, really good. Uh, but thank you for your interest uh, and for your attention today, and uh, take care, everyone. <laughs>